Celebrating Culture. We're here today with Mariana Gatto, who is the director of the Italian American Museum in Los Angeles. Mariana, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. My um, great-grandfather arrived in New Orleans in 1897, and he worked in the sugarcane industry for a season, scraped together his earnings, and sent for the rest of the family who remained in my ancestral village of Luca Sicola, Sicily. I think it's important to recognize that the 1891 lynching of Italians in New Orleans did not occur in a vacuum. It was but one expression of the growing animosity towards Italian immigrants, both nationally and locally in the Southern United States. Nationally, the event coincided with a push to pass legislation that would limit Italian immigration to the United States and bar Italians from entering the nation entirely. It also occurred in tandem with the growing eugenics movement and the publishing of political cartoons that depicted Italian immigrants escaping from the slums of Europe with words such as murderer and criminal written on their backs. It took place at the same time that immigration officials were racializing Southern Italians. When the U.S. government created the designation Southern Italian on immigration documents, Remember, about 75% of Italian immigrants hailed from Italy's impoverished South. And the designation Southern Italian differentiated this group from their more fair Northern Italian counterparts. In the South, Italians were considered an in-between race, somewhere between black and white, and in some parts were segregated. Meanwhile, the Italian population is increasing. The political and economic power of Southern Italians, of Sicilians, is also growing in places like New Orleans. Therefore, Italians and Sicilians are seen as a threat. While many other Sicilians, including people from my family's village of Luca Sicula, remained in New Orleans after the lynching, my family wasted no time in getting out. It's estimated that following the lynching, upwards of 25,000 Italians, uh, mostly Sicilians, left New Orleans. Where did they go? They went elsewhere in the Mississippi Delta, where incidentally we would witness lynchings of Italians, uh, Sicilians, take place in the years that followed, it's including the 1899 lynching of five Italians in Tallulah, Louisiana. And just recently, the state of Mississippi, where the victims were buried, created a marker in memory of these largely forgotten victims of racial violence. In fact, between 1890 and 1910, Sicilians were less than 4% of the population, yet they constituted 40% of the so-called white victims of Southern lynch mobs. Mariana, I understand that Italians faced considerable animosity in several parts of the nation. Ludlow is another example. Tragedies such as the Ludlow Massacre, um, which took place in 1914 in a little town in southern Colorado, where striking coal miners who were you know, agitating for better wages and living conditions were attacked by guards hired by their employers and members of the Colorado National Guard and 25 people were killed, uh, the majority of which were women and children as young as three months old. In this former mining town, you'll find a monument dedicated to the victims of the Ludlow Massacre. The Ludlow Massacre was a watershed in American labor history that would you know, slowly lead to some of the reforms that would impact you know, workers' lives across the nation and um, lead to many of the rights that we take for granted today. By the time my family settled in the southern Italian city of Pueblo, Colorado, which was then a steel manufacturing hub for the nation, there was a gentleman by the name of Hector Chialirone, 
who had emerged as a leader of Pueblo's Italian-American community. Carlirone was a journalist. He was the founder of one of Pueblo's Italian language newspapers. He was also the president of the Colombian Federation of Italian-American Societies, which was an umbrella organization of Italian-American groups throughout the nation. In 1892, the year following the lynching, Chialirone and another Italian from Pueblo, a gentleman by the name of Colombo de la Quadri, traveled to the Colombian Federation's National Convention. The men addressed the crowd, the, the thousands of attendees present. Chialirone and de la Quadri implored the attendees to return to their respective cities and towns and raise money to create monuments dedicated to Columbus across the nation, and the men's advocacy worked. In the years that followed, we witnessed a proliferation of building of Columbus statues and monuments all over the nation. Chialirone and another Italian from Colorado by the name of Angelo Noce also led the push to have Colorado establish Columbus Day as a legal holiday. Chialirone and Noce urged the Italian American community to stake their claim over this great explorer, this American hero, and link their heritage to the man who was widely considered the founder of the American nation. This I interpret as Chialirone, Dalle Quadri, and other leaders of the Italian-American communities attempt to really uplift Italian-Americans and identify Columbus as a person of Italian extraction to be proud of. I believe this was their attempt to communicate that Italian immigrants weren't the Dagos as they were portrayed by the media, but the descendants of great explorers. In 1907, Colorado becomes the first state in the nation to establish Columbus Day as a legal holiday. Calerone and Noche, along with the Knights of Columbus, would also be the catalyst behind the creation of Columbus Day as a federal holiday. Following the founding of the American nation, you know, our leaders were looking for a hero that was free of association from the British, and they selected Columbus. In the years that followed, the feminine version of Columbus's name, Columbia, is personified as this goddess. Columbia becomes the symbol of the American nation that actually predates Uncle Sam. We also see just a plethora of places, features, institutions named in Columbus's honor from the Columbia River to Columbus, Ohio, Columbia Records, Columbia University, which had previously been King's College, of course the nation's capital, Washington, the District of Columbia, companies like Columbia Sportswear, CBS, which is the Columbia Broadcast System, and then of course the Moon Rocket and the Space Shuttle. Thank you for being Thank on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And stay tuned, we'll be right back with more Celebrating Culture.